Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alistair Barron, and as the current governor, I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the Company of Merchant Adventurers of the City of York to our Arts Discovery Talk in the partnership with the University of York tonight. We are pleased to be able to hold this event once again in person in our ancient hall and that we have many new faces as well as familiar ones in our audience tonight. Some of you may have visited before, but for those not so familiar, let me just give you a little background on the company and its hall. The hall was built between 1357 and 1361 for a religious fraternity dedicated to our Lord Jesus Christ and the Blessed Virgin Mary, which was renamed the Company of Merchant Adventurers of the City of York. The hall is unique. It is the oldest surviving semi-timbered guild hall still intact in Britain. More remarkable still, it has remained all this time in the ownership of the organization that built it 660 years ago. The company has a long and prestigious history in promoting enterprise and commercial venturing, business risk taking. A merchant adventurer was quite simply a merchant who risked his or her capital in pursuit of wealth. Today, the company, as well as maintaining its in, and improving its hall for the education, employment, and enjoyment of the public, also is involved in a range of charitable activities and is an active force in the economic development of the city of York. And I have to say, we're very greatly appreciate our involvement with the University of York. The company was very involved in the campaign that led to the formation of the university in 1960. Turning to tonight's event and Professor Sarah Brown's talk on, on the restoration of the St. Cuthbert's window and its companions at York Minster. It is remarkable to think that when Saint, the St. Cuthbert winger, window was installed in the South Choir of York Minster in 1440, the hall was already 80 years old. We can only imagine uh, the discussions amongst the merchants here in the Great Hall about the new splendid stained glass windows and how much they must have cost. Perhaps the thoughts of members of the company at the time turned to the window depicting St. William, a figure very familiar to the merchants of York. William was an English priest and twice Archbishop of York. After his death in dubious circumstances, uh, a number of miracles were attributed to him. One of which related to the collapse of the old Ooze Bridge from the weight of a crowd of people who had gathered to greet William. Quite amazingly, no one was killed. When the bridge was rebuilt, a chapel was situated on the spot where the miracle is said to have occurred, dedicated to St. William. The merchants would have known this chapel well as they had rooms close by on the bridge to monitor the unloading of their cargo on the stays below. It is certainly fitting that after 500 years we are once again discussing the great windows of York Minster in the Hall. Sarah, as Director of York Glaziers Trust, Director of the University's MA in Stained Glass Conservation, and as a member of the Merchant Adventures Companies, it's, it's truly a delight, a, a triple delight, to welcome her here this evening to hear us speak. And it's now my great pleasure to hand over to Matthias Ruth, the Pro Vice Chancellor, uh, to uh, extend the, the welcome to Sarah and tell us a little bit more. Thank you, Matthias. Good evening, 
everybody. I'm Matthias Roos. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research uh, at the University of York, and it's my distinct, distinct honor and pleasure to welcome and introduce our speaker, Professor Sarah Brown. The annual Arts Discovery event, event uh, has proved enormously popular and successful, and this lecture tonight will be the 11th of what is a stimulating and thought-provoking series. Organized jointly by the university and the Merchant Adventurers, these lectures are a platform for the university to demonstrate in the city its world-leading research in arts and humanities. This lecture is also part of York Ideas, the University of York's year-long series of events to educate, entertain, and inspire. This series then culminates in York Festival of Ideas in June each year. As a university for public good, based in a city of ideas and innovation, our commitment is to engage with as diverse a set of audiences as we can, and to do what we can to widen participation in education. After bringing last year's lecture in this series to you in an online format, we are delighted that we can meet today in this grand hall. And I want to thank everyone for being here and being part of that. And on this note, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Sarah Brown. Sarah is a professor in the university's Department of History of Art, one of the largest and most dynamic communities of art historians in the UK, and also in the Center of Medieval Studies, one of the world's leading centers for postgraduate studies and research into the Middle Ages. Alongside these teaching and research roles, as you've just heard, She's also the director and chief executive of the York Glaciers Trust. Sarah is an expert in stained glass, its history, and its conservation. In all of the various roles that she plays, she helps to preserve stained glass for the future, both by teaching the experts of tomorrow and by being actively involved in a variety of stained glass projects. In her role, at the Glacier Trust. She's responsible for the care of the stained class of York Minster and for projects for external clients throughout the UK. And recently, she oversaw the conservation of the Great East Window of York Minster, which dates back to 1405 to 1408. Sarah joined the Art History Department in 2008 after a long and distinguished career with the Royal Commission on the Historical Monuments of England and subsequently with English heritage. She has worked on ecclesiastic architecture and state class for all of all periods while specializing in the history and conservation of state class of the Middle Ages and Gothic revival. She is particularly interested in the intersection between art and craft and history of state class restoration in Great Britain. And with that introduction, I would like to welcome Sarah, introduce her talk, her topic, and want to thank you again all for being part of this. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sarah Brown. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, thank you very much indeed for your warm words of welcome. And I must say, it's a delight to be back in the hall um, this evening. I'm going to talk to you, as has been explained, um, about the conservation of the St Cuthbert window, but at the same time we are also bringing into the studio for the first time um, images in glass of St William, who's been mentioned already by Alistair, and also um, images of Richard Scroop, not formally and officially um, sanctified, but of course in 15th century York, well known as a putative saint. 
But just in case you're not familiar with the Minster and its glass, or indeed you're visiting from further afield outside the city, it's important to remind ourselves that we who are so familiar with the Minster are effectively in the presence of one of the greatest collections of medieval stained glass of all periods. We have one of the most diverse collections, and this has been very long recognized, and I have some quotes on my screen, which I won't uh, trouble you by reading, but for Celia Fiennes, who was clearly uh, a woman who needed to be impressed, she herself thought that the Minster was particularly interesting for its collection of windows. And then in 2009, in much more recent times, the Minister's um, Conservation Management Plan uh, acknowledged the importance of this one single collection in one building. And although, of course, Canterbury Cathedral lays all sorts of claims to a stained glass collection, I think we can safely say that ours is both larger and more diverse in terms of its chronology. We have glass dating from the 12th century through to the 18th century and beyond. But this evening, I'm going to focus on three windows um, located in the southeast choir transept. And I'm just going to turn to point. We're interested in this area here. This is the location of the high altar in the Middle Ages. In this location, of course, the window dedicated to St. William. And in this location, the window located to St. Cuthbert flanked on either side by another uh, window here dedicated to William and here dedicated to Richard Scroop, far less well known than those two windows um, uh, on the north side. And what's very interesting is that these northern saints were basically designed to illuminate the minster's high altar. So, in March uh, of this year, we began the process of bringing these windows um, out of the Minster and into the workshop. And this was more or less the first project that we were able to reactivate after our, I think, third period of lockdown in what had been an extremely difficult year. So it was wonderful to bring the team back together and immediately to begin work on this uh, process. And here you see one of my colleagues chipping out the glass from the St. Cuthbert window. But before I go into a little more detail about the Cuthbert window itself, I just wanted to outline um, a sort of the context for the conservation of this window by outlining a sort of catalogue of the problems that we have to contend with in caring for the minister's windows. First of all, we have problems caused by the chemical alteration of the glass material from which the windows are made. This is a process which uh, begins almost as soon as the glass is placed in the window openings, but it is a process which is triggered and accelerated by the action of moisture. Once the glass begins this process of alteration, we begin to find a series of corrosion uh, um, holes which begin to develop across the surface of the glass, both inside and outside. And of course, once the glass itself is weakened and thinned by this pro uh, process of corrosion, it becomes extremely vulnerable to other mechanical pressures and of course, in high-level clearstream windows, we are talking about particularly wind pressure. And those of us who walk to work past the west front of the Minster know that around the Minster, the winds can indeed be quite formidable. I'm showing you a couple of details from choir clearstream windows taken prior to recent conservation. And one in particular, which is especially alarming, is this one, where a crack has basically opened up and run right through the body of the glass and also, indeed, through the adjoining lead net. And this is just the effects of wind pressure on thinned and weakened glass. 
Eventually, the corrosion pits that you saw in the previous slide coalesce to the extent that they begin to form holes in the glass. And this is, uh, these two details are taken from windows in the nave aisle, thankfully now conserved and, and protected. But sadly, once we get to this point in the um, corrosion process, we have effectively lost historic material that cannot ever be replaced. So our intention, of course, is always to get there um, before we have got to quite this uh, state. The problem with glass corrosion, of course, is that it is not just confined, as one might imagine, to the exterior surfaces. This process of glass alteration, triggered by moisture, is in many respects most concerning when it applies to the internal surfaces of the window, because of course this is where the majority of the painted decoration, which turns these colored mosaics into works of art, is located. And this gives you two details showing the effects of corrosion on the internal surface. This is an example of where the very thin upper level of the red color in a flashed red glass has been effectively corroded away by moisture attack. And here you can see in a nave um, aisle window how the painted decoration has been more or less scoured away from the glass surface. There are small areas where the paint has actually protected the glass, but otherwise the window is now in a, a very serious state of corrosion. Another of the problems we face in York Minster, I'm afraid to say, is as a consequence of the wholesale re-leading of the windows from the 1930s onwards. There was very much a feeling that a very sturdy, strong, thick lead would keep the windows safe and secure in the windows. And this approach was accelerated in the post-war period when Dean Eric Milner-White uh, spearheaded the restoration of a lot of glass that had been removed for safekeeping during the Second World War. Although, of course, this process was entirely well-meaning, it means that in, in some windows it remains extremely challenging trying to read the narrative of the windows. And it was, of course, something that we sought to address in our uh, conservation of the Great East Window. We also have um, the consequences of older approaches uh, to conservation and repair. It was well understood that um, mending leads um, introduced by previous generations of glaziers, a necessary evil in the restoration of glass in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, was nonetheless rather disfiguring. And so from the 1920s onwards, attempts were made to do away, wherever possible, with mending leads that were particularly disfiguring across faces, for example. And one of the ways this was done was by creating effectively um, a sandwich of modern glass on both sides of the medieval glass. Um, and the pieces, the broken fragments, were just held between these two plain pieces. And here you see two examples um, from the Southern Choir Clear Street, and also, of course, one of the heads from the Cuthbert window itself. Now, the problem with this plating technique is that the glass fragments basically rattle about inside the plated sandwich, and therefore more damage can uh, be caused. But equally, um, it is a problem that these sandwiches were not sealed in any way. So over time, we get moisture and dirt creeping in and effectively a kind of microclimate forming, which can, of course, over time be extremely damaging. And this is a, cu a couple of details showing you where these plates have basically cracked open and you can see a sort of tide mark this is where water has actually made its way. I hate to think what this is, probably something left by an insect 
that has made its way inside. And you can see almost a sort of tide mark where at one point this plate has basically filled up with water. And here you can see the way that individual pieces within the plating have begun to shift around um, under pressure. And then, of course, we have great problems with our inherited and predominantly ferrous um, fixing systems. These are the bars that hold the windows in place. And as I think we all know, when a ferrous metal rusts, it actually expands and it causes all kinds of damage to stonework, but also to glass. And this is, in fact, the sort of Cuthbert window some years ago. And you can see the way in which, as the bar has expanded and distorted, it's actually forced all this glass upwards, and it's basically cracked it. So one of the priorities now is to try to replace all these bars with non-ferrous materials for the good of both the glass and the stone. The problem, of course, is enormous because we have so many windows. So some years ago, we decided that we needed to have a more strategic approach to our scant resources for stained glass conservation. We were, of course, very fortunate in attracting very large sums of money from the National Heritage Lottery. But, of course, we have 128 windows, of which, at the time we began our strategic planning, um, 70 of them had no kind of protection from this whole range of uh, problems. So we began to think about how we might move forward and provide a stable environment for all the windows in a reasonable uh, time scale. So the strategic plan um, emerged. We wanted to get away from a situation which um, affected the Minster in the past, where basically we waited for a disaster like the 1984 fire in the South Transept, or we waited for a large piece of stone to fall off the East Front, as happened in about 2005. We felt that planning ahead was something we ought to be better at doing. Underpinning all our planning is the introduction of a kind of ventilated double glazing, which research um, led by the Corpus Vitriarum, which is an international collaboration of art historians and conservators. In, the, in Great Britain, its headquarters is the University of York. But over many years, the work of conservators and historians of glass have demonstrated that this kind of protected glazing is the most important single intervention that we can uh, in, uh, introduce to protect our windows. And those of you who live in York will know that for quite some time, you could see in the Great East window, not the historic stained glass, but this marvelous uh, pattern of modern glazing, a sacrificial new window, which now protects the East window from the elements. And because we ventilate the space between the outer external glazing and the historic stained glass, with air from inside the building, it passes into the inner space and on a warm day it will move up and out of the inner space again. On cooler days it works in the opposite direction. To be perfectly honest, it doesn't matter which direction it moves in as long as it keeps moving. And in so doing, it keeps both surfaces of the historic glass dry. This is now um, an approach to conservation which has been going since just after the Second World War. And thankfully, in York, its benefits are very well understood. Unfortunately, we still have to do a good job selling this approach in other places. And this is where our underpinning research on monitoring and our data from the Minster comes into, um, into great use. This is just a view of the installation happening in the Chapter House vestibule. And because we still get some moisture collecting in this um, ventilated glazing system, we create um, a tray at the bottom with a little gravel in it, which allows water out of the building safely over a lead covering on the sill. So we do no damage to the stonework um, as we get this um, condensation moisture out of the space. 
For the Great East Window, we were able to uh, put together some uh, monitoring. Um, the cost of environmental monitoring has dropped considerably. Once upon a time, you could only do this with a bank of um, instruments that looked a bit like a three-piece suite. Um, now you can do it with something which actually is much closer to um, a cigarette packet. And this is the consequences of our uh, monitoring for the Great East Window. And it basically tells us that while there were some condensation episodes on the external glazing, the protected medieval glass remained uh, dry right throughout um, the period. And we are now giving advice to Great Malvern Priory, for example, um, as they begin the journey towards protecting their windows. So as a centre of excellence, York is really now beginning to spread the word about best, the best possible conservation practice. It's clear, however, when you have over 70 windows in need of protection, you cannot do as we did for the Great East Window and dismantle every single one of them every time. The Great East Window was a wonderful project, but it took six years to, to complete. It cost over seven million pounds, and we felt that something that sort of enabled us to move up a gear was going to be important. So we took, um, we reflected upon a project that we undertook not very long before the East Window, which was to protect and do a little conservation of one of the windows in the Chapter House um, vestibule. And this is the window in question, and I'm just showing you a before and after. So you can see no dramatic transformation, but a, a considerable um, increase in legibility and clarity in the figure. And this has been the um, line that we are taking now with our plan. So on to Cuthbert and the Saints of the North. And this is the plan just to uh, remind you where we are. And I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge in particular um, the recent doctoral research of Dr. Katie Harrison, one of our research associates in the History of Art Department. Katie has done tremendous work on transforming our understanding of the narrative construction of this window, and in particular, its relationship to illuminated manuscripts. And so as we go through the process of conservation, which as you heard is in its infancy, um, the narrative of this window will be revealed ever more clearly and, and already now is available online um, with uh, Katie's reassignment of some of the scenes. This is one of three great windows in the choir for which glass was being stockpiled in 1399. And Richard Scroop, who I mentioned a moment ago, had borrowed a 12th century illuminated manuscript of the life of St. Cuthbert, seemingly in a process of uh, background research, as it were, into the life of the saint. But on either side of um, St. Cuthbert, we have these two fascinating windows that are extremely difficult to see when you stand in the Minster. The easternmost window depicting uh, Richard uh, Scroop. This is the only image in the Minster in stained glass in which Richard Scroop is treated as a saint. And this was really quite a daring thing to do because, of course, he became a sort of politicized figure having been um, executed at the hands of the Lancastrian King Henry IV. His cult became a sort of bit of a political football, if you like. But this window was given by his own nephew, Stephen, who kneels at his feet. And you can see that he is dressed as an archbishop, but he has been given um, a halo or nimbus in this image. And he is accompanied um, on the opposite side of the transept by an image of St. William, who of course was enshrined very close by and was of course a, a politically perfectly acceptable saint who died in the 12th century, but who of course had been formally canonized um, by the papacy. Now these windows of course have had a very checkered history and Katie's research has helped us shine light on this. 
Um, we, of course, were well aware that the window was um, significantly restored in the 1880s by the well-known um, York stained glass artist, John Ward Knowles. But as we have worked our way through the panels, we've also found evidence of other interventions um, dating from um, the 18th century. And I hope you can see on a, a single piece of glass, uh, we've got um, graffiti of three different periods. Um, and this is one of John Ward Knowles's attempts to create something that looked uh, 15th century. The 1880s restoration was um, actually supervised by um, Canon Fowler, um, a canon of Durham Cathedral, but he proved to be knowledgeable as to the iconography of Cuthbert, but I don't think he was terribly good at looking at medieval arts because he clearly struggled to identify a lot of the scenes. We know that there was another major intervention in the 1930s, and this is one of the very few photographs we have from that period, but you can see that they were, in effect, completely dismantling um, the glass. Um, these are the rubbings that they had made preparatory to dismantling, and they completely re the glass at this time. And it's important to remind ourselves, and I do it with pleasure using um, one of the paintings in the collection of this very company, that in the 1930s, although one would not perhaps have described York as a great industrial center, it was still a town, a city, in which everybody lit a coal fire every evening. There was, of course, industry in York, which is why in the First World War, it was a, a, a military target. And of course, in this view, we can see the effects of the burning of coal fires. So it, what, even in the late 19th century, comments were being made on the impact of sulfurous air on both stone and glass. So as a consequence, in the 1930s, they introduced the first version of protective glazing. And in fact, this was picking up something that had actually already started as early as the 1860s. So York was very much in the vanguard in terms of environmental protection. The problem with this 1930s protection is that it was in the form of repeated diamond quarries. And although this is, of course, a traditional glazing technique, it does cast very unfortunate shadows on the glass when perceived from inside the building. Uh, particularly here, you can see the crisscrossing of the leads behind the figures. There again, you can see it. And this has very significantly reduced the transmission of light through the windows. So in our protective glazing, in due course, we hope to remedy this. These were some photographs we took. Um, almost immediately, the glass came into the studio. You can see thick mattings of dust and other materials that I will not go into in any detail, but you can imagine we're all walking about in the building, wearing our coats and goodness knows what, and this thick matting of an organic material mixed with soot and dust is not only detracting from the brightness of the glass, it's also protecting, uh, providing um, a layer that can hold moisture against the surface and it can also provide a rich source of nutrition for mould. And mould um, microbes of all sorts excrete oxalic acid, which is a very damaging material to glass over long periods of time. So our reasons for cleaning the windows are not just because cosmetically we enhance them, but also because there are good technical reasons uh, for improving their life chances. And here are some of those plates that I mentioned to you earlier. You can see extremely dirty uh, rivulets of moisture have run down the front of this glass and you can just see how much um, light and transmission, transmission is being um, inhibited by the dirt on the plates.
And when we opened up some of these plated packages, we found, as we expected, lots of dirt trapped in the middle of them. So this is a process which requires nerves of steel, as you can imagine, but is also extremely beneficial. And I'm showing you in this slide, this is the head of St. Oswald before conservation. You can see all the little glimmers of light as all the pieces have shifted around inside the plates. And this shows you the same panel now on um, exhibition in the Minster, so you can go and see it for yourself. We have here been able to use modern epoxy resins as an adhesive, which means we no longer need to use the plates, but nor do we need to use mending leads, so we can have the best of all possible worlds and bring this once magnificent head back to something like um, its original appearance. And again, I'm doing a before and after. You can see areas in which it's been possible as well to pare back some of the <coughs> thickest of the mending nets. So here, for example, we've been able to achieve it. We've done a little bit of trimming back of those thick leads in this wonderful eagle. The story here, of course, is the eagle has brought a fish to St. Cuthbert, and St. Cuthbert then shares the fish um, with half feeding himself and his monks and half uh, feeding the eagle. We've also used modest amounts of a cold paint, which is an entirely reversible intervention. But in the 1950s, it was very common to introduce blank, unpainted pieces of modern glass because ethically it was believed with very good reason that this was an honest form of repair, which indeed it is. Aesthetically, however, it can be very unfortunate because these blank, unpainted pieces, um, when read against transmitted light in the windows, can be extremely distracting to the eye. So I'm drawing your attention to this tree, for example, and here, this is exactly the same glass all we have done is added a little cold paint. In other words, it's not been fired. In future, if anyone wished to remove it, they could do so. But it just tones down those insertions and the eye is no longer drawn to them inexorably as was the case before. And this is one of the most magnificent panels. This shows the um, York glass artist's vision of the shrine of Cuthbert as it then was um, in Durham, and of course, no longer surviving. But we've been able to uh, do some edge bonding and actually uh, replace these very thick leads and create a tiny little infill with, in this case, a little bit of paint carrying through um, the story um, carried in the medieval window. And here we see um, the head, uh, the upper part of the body of St. Cuthbert himself. And in, in examining this figure, we found something very exciting. We found evidence of a technique that we did not um, imagine was to be found in this window. It's a technique known as dueling, and it is described in the 12th century treatise by a, a, a monk, uh, a German, probably a German monk, who adopted the pen name Theophilus. And he tells you how to go about enriching the surface of a stained glass window. We know of examples of this kind of technique um, in Germany, in Regensburg Cathedral, dating from the 12th century. And one of our York conservation students found another example of this technique in early 13th century glass in Germany. But here in the St. Cuthbert window, used to enrich the figure of Cuthbert himself, we see this same technique. And we can see that exactly what Theophilus describes is what they were doing. So they have a thick um, paste of glass paint, literally attaching the jewel to the surface. These, of course, are not jewels. They're just pieces of contrasting colored glass. Uh, little green ones here. Now, Theophilus rather optimistically says they will never fall off. Well, in fact, they do very occasionally fall off, and there's one that has fallen off 
and indeed there is another one there. But you can see that in fact, just as he says, none of the glass paint has gone underneath the jewel, so it's allowed to, to um, show up in all its brilliance. And I think this is a measure of how this figure of Cuthbert was given extra symbolic worth by applying this extraordinary technique. How glass painters in 15th century York knew about this technique, they certainly, I, I don't think they were reading copies of Theophilus's treatise, but nonetheless it shows a tremendous um, reservoir of artistry and skill present, present in York in the 15th century. And I'd like to conclude with some thanks, of course. Um, thank you for the invitation to speak to you this evening. But I would also just like to acknowledge uh, my colleagues in the York Glazes Trust, because when I say we, I really mean they uh, do all the work. And I would particularly like to single out my colleagues Nancy Georgi and Megan Stacey, both of them graduates of the university's MA in stained glass conservation, who have led on the conservation of this window. We work very closely, of course, with our colleagues in the Minster Stoneyard, and the exhibition and our understanding of the window has been greatly enhanced by the research of Dr. Katie Harrison and also Dr. Helen Rawson, who is the new Head of Heritage and Participation um, in the Minster, who, who really was the mastermind behind the exhibi exhibition. And both the conservation and the exhibition have been, of course, funded by the York Minster Fund. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. very kindly agreed to uh, take questions um, and so if I may uh, as my prerogative perhaps uh, kick things off um, Sarah I wondered uh, do you think that the new techniques used in conservation and protection will mean the length of time until future restoration work is needed will increase significantly Yes, I, 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 she would say that, wouldn't she? Um, yes, I think so, because these are windows that are literally hundreds of years old, and they demonstrate thereby the fact that this is an extremely durable art form. And by creating this kind of stable, protected environment, we are basically massively extending their lives because they will no longer be subjected to those environmental forces that cause their deterioration. I would be foolish to say how many hundreds of years um, we have extended their life, um, but the scaffolding cycle for the Minster is 100 years plus. In other words, once we've finished our work, the Dean hopes, of course, that we won't need to go back for at least a century. And I'm actually fairly confident that we will be adding literally centuries now to the lifespan of these windows. And we're intervening just at the right moment when the windows are still, of course, um, extraordinarily well preserved. Question the lady in front. May I ask a very civic question? When you see all these really, really broken pieces that are very small and yes. there is a very thick light around them, yes. and you just showed that it is possible to make the lead level thinner, yes. why would you not make it thinner everywhere? Well, the, the problem is, uh, oh, I say the problem, in this particular project we have decided we are not going to dismantle and completely Reled the windows. There is always a risk in dismantling panels of glass, and also that act of dismantling and re-leading massively increases the time span and the cost involved in the conservation. That is what we did with the Great East Window, and I remain proud of what we did there, but we felt that 
in the aftermath of that project, if we didn't sort of um, accelerate the progress of our intervention and our stabilization, by the time we'd worked our way around the building, we would have nothing left. So we are basically um, holding ourselves back. We, are, we're, we think we're stabilizing the glass and there will be another generation thankfully of York trained conservators now, who will in, at some point in the future, I think, return to the windows with time on their side, and they will then be able to make a decision about what the next stage in the conservation of the glass might be. But thank you for your question. <laughs> question in the middle one. Um, the gentleman in the middle. <laughs> so, um, the duelling is very exciting. Yes. Um, oh, thank you, the duelling. Um, is there any evidence of duelling in other cathedrals, um, particularly Canterbury? Well, I have to say, I'm not aware of any in Canterbury. <laughs> <laughs> Hurrah! Um, I must say, I think a, a Twitter account called Number One Cathedral shows very, um, a, a very hubristic approach. Actually, I shouldn't have said that. If this is being transmitted, I'll never be allowed to go to Canterbury <laughs> ever again. Um, no, uh, there are, I'm not aware of any examples um, at Canterbury. In the Burrell collection in Glasgow, there is an extraordinary collection of um, heraldic glass from the late 15th and early 16th century, from originally from Forsley Hall in Northamptonshire. And that does have, in the uh, affixing of some of the tiny charges onto very complex shields, it does have a technique that is rather similar but not exactly the same. This is almost textbook Theophilus, if you like. Um, so there, I am sure, now we've started looking, we will find other examples. And indeed, if you go to St. Michael Spurrier Gate, in one of the windows there, there are one or two still attached and quite a few that have come off. And even in, in the St. Cuthbert window, we think some of them might have been knocked off in previous rather heavy-handed um, cleaning phases. But um, eyes, keep your eyes peeled, I think, is the message. <laughs> Gentlemen, the second row at the front here. Can you say anything about the person who's painted these windows? In the case of the greatest window, sorry, in the case of the greatest window, of course, we do have a name. I don't know if you didn't say anything about the name. No, the we, we don't know who was responsible for this window. I think it's not John Thornton. I mean, John Thornton left his mark, of course, in the quality of glass painting in the city. But the last documented reference to John Thornton is in the 1430s. Um, and this window is stylistically a little different. I mean, it shows a number of affinities with Thornton's work, but I don't think it's actually by Thornton. But this is something which is still undergoing examination, and I think through having the, the window in the studio, where we're able, of course, to take high-resolution new photographs, we'll be able to sort of examine the degree to which we can perhaps identify individual hands within the window. Can I I mean, is there a York school, so to speak, in the <laughs> 15th century? Well, um, J.A. Knowles, um, son of John Ward Knowles, wrote a whole book called The York School of Glass Painting. And as a York man born and bred, I think he was very keen to promote the idea of a York school. I think it's true to say there's definitely a kind of Thornton style, but of course, ironically, we can't point to an individual panel and say that was definitely painted by John Thornton. I think Thornton's standards, um, which derive more broadly speaking from in what we call international Gothic, um, was very um, influential in the city. But if you were to go to Great Malvern, for example, you would see glass that looks really quite like 
uh, York in, in broad terms. Now, of course, J.A. Knowles argued that all the glass at Great Malvern was painted in York. All I can say is they would have been rushed off their feet if they were both glazing the choir of the Minster and the parish churches in the city and then also trying to create windows in, in Great Malvern. I think what we see is a sort of stylistic affinity which had become very popular and I'm sure it was in no small measure due to Thornton's eminence and uh, reputation but I think most of us would now be a little hesitant to say there is a York school. Question from the gentleman at second row at the front. <laughs> Hello, thank you for your, for your very eloquent speech, talk. Um, I assume before people paint glass, they must have, they must have done a painting, uh, a drawing, a sketch as to how it's going to be. Yes. Do you have any of those original uh, no. drawings and sketches? <laughs> In short, no, we don't. Um, what is so fascinating about both the East Window and the St Cuthbert Window is that art historical research gives us some kind of insights into the source materials that were influencing um, the scenes. In the Great East Window, there are two groups of Apocalypse manuscripts which clearly were somehow familiar to John Thornton. In the case of this window, there is a 12th century illuminated life of St Cuthbert and some of the scenes in that book borrowed as I mentioned by Archbishop's group are clearly informing the design of the glass but I don't think we've just got a source copy kind of relationship. But they, um, did have, they did have a painting to work to. They had, they had small scale sketch designs mm. They're often referred to in the medieval accounts as patterns on paper. They probably were not very large, um, and they were then scaled up. It was the job of the master glazier to scale them up. This was not done in this period on paper cartoons, as would be done in the Victorian period. They were scaled up and drawn out on basically a, a whitened trestle table. And this table served as both a cartoon and subsequently a workbench. And the one surviving example of one of these tables is in fact in Catalonia. It was the subject of a detailed study by one of our students. And what it shows is that not all of the detail was marked out by the master because basically they were working in a close-knit uh, relationship where a degree of autonomy was allowed to the individual painters and glaziers. So we think that these were not large workshops, these were probably small groups of people and you know they were working from relatively small scale models. Uh, hi. Um, I wanted to know if there is any sort of management plan that we could implement to for the daily upkeep of not daily but upkeep of the glass, or is it just one time intervention and then we? Well, the windows are so enormous um, to get to them. You need scaffolding on both sides. So one of the reasons that we're so enthusiastic about this kind of protective glazing is first of all because we know it's extremely effective at keeping the glass safe from its greatest enemy, moisture, which of course internally is through condensation. And it means that we can actually step back and not have to intervene at regular intervals. We do of course uh, do a quinquennial inspection every five years so our surveyor looks at the building and we look at the glass and if we observe any problems we are able then to intervene and suggest a program of work but we're talking about I mean the east window is the size of a tennis court so you know the problem really is that getting up close to it is extremely challenging now new technologies of course are going to be very exciting 
And we, just this week, we began looking at whether drones can begin to work. Um, I have to say, the one we looked at, once it got inside the building, it wouldn't go any higher than, I think, five metres, which, frankly, in the Minster is no use to anybody. <laughs> so drones, for the moment, you know, we're not so persuaded. But, I mean, the management plan is effectively this programme of conservation, low-level intervention with protection, and then quinquennial inspection going forwards. Question from the lady in the middle, on second row. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, in the current exhibition of the St. Cuthbert window in the Minster, there is a wonderful representation of a moving ship. Yes. Are you able to explain how that's achieved? Well, I'm glad you said wonderful. I'm afraid because some of us were slightly ambivalent about it. Um, apparently, this is a very sort of new kind of thing appearing in lots of exhibitions. And there was a feeling that creating um, both a moving um, visualisation with a soundscape was desirable. Um, it was quite difficult to achieve because one of the questions w was which bits did you indicate moving? So we provided a kind of overlay drawing which tried to indicate to the, um, the IT people which elements sort of worked together within the leading pattern. And we also tried to focus on the lead lines that were original and ignored the mending leads. At one point, we had a version which had two parts of the fish at the bottom moving in opposite directions, which <laughs> was a little bit peculiar. Um, and of course, the other area was that we wanted a soundscape that was not just sort of background music, but which was actually relevant to the period in which the window was made. So we, we got some very helpful advice um, from scholars in, in the liturgical and musical world who were able to point us not actually to something um, composed for York, but at least composed for the court of Henry VI, um, in whose reign the window was made. So it was nice to feel that um, while not everybody perhaps would recognise um, the soundscape, at least we felt it had an authenticity about it. Um, but I'm glad you thought it was successful. <laughs> Not just me, either. Good, good. <laughs> I'll pass it on to Helen Rawson. <laughs> a question from the fourth row. Good evening, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. You've alluded to future conservation efforts by people many years down the line. I was wondering if you could share anything about the archive you're leaving for them as to what you've done, where you've oh. done it, how you've done it, and how it could be reversed. It's terabytes of data. We now, of course, automatically create um, an absolute wealth of documentation for our successors, because one of the biggest challenges we always face is basically trying to work out what on earth the previous people actually did. Um, so we now um, document everything with great precision. We have raised our game in photographic terms very significant, so significantly. So if any of you have seen the stained glass navigator, you will know that you can zoom in and see you know, every crack in, in the glass. Um, we also, of course, create graphic mapping of the condition of the glass. So we map the condition as we inherit it. We then also, most importantly, map all our interventions. So we would indicate, for example, um, if there are any infills or resin bonds, we don't just say that's glue, we say which glue it is, because we use more than one kind of epoxy resin. We will also, where we've applied a cold paint, we will also map that and, of course, we record exactly what it is so that in future anyone who wants to know what would be the appropriate solvent will not left, be left, you know, scratching their heads. They will know exactly how to go about, you know, intervening as may be appropriate in the future. And this all goes into the Minster Library. We do now work digitally. 
which opens up interesting new research opportunities because of the way that one can layer data and, and collate you know, information of different sorts in one environment. Um, but we still, of course, keep paper records as well. It seems we don't have any more questions. <laughs> thank you very much, Sarah. My pleasure, thank you. Sarah, thank you very much for your wonderful talk and for answering the questions so fully and uh, with such great detail and knowledge. Uh, you've provided us with a, a fascinating insight into the program of conservation and protection, uh, the meticulous processes, how technology has transformed the way uh, restoration work is carried out. Um, I think uh, cotton wool is still uh, important as well. Um, we are extremely work, uh, grateful. Your work and that of the York Glaziers Trust has brought international recognition to the city and we really do appreciate that. And this brings uh, an end to proceedings. I would just like to thank you all very much for coming and uh, wish you a safe journey home. So thank you. <laughs>